Today we are going to talk about spasmodic dysphonia and we're really just giving an overview. This is really meant to be patient oriented, um, just giving some information about the different types of spasmodic dysphonia, the history of spasmodic dysphonia, some different treatment options available. Um, spasmodic dysphonia, of course, is a very devastating voice disorder that many patients have to live with for a lifetime, and many patients go undiagnosed for years. And so it can be um, very stressful, very, very challenging for the patient and their families. Um, so we just wanted to share some information with them today. So if you look at the history of spasmodic dysphonia, it's very interesting. Um, it wasn't until Traub described this in 1871 as spastic dysphonia that people started really recognizing it as a disorder. Um, and they really didn't know what caused it. And so to understand what's causing spas spasmodic dysphonia, it's important to understand the anatomy. And if you look at the anatomy, we actually have three separate uh, muscles that close the vocal cords. So we have the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle right here. Um, we have this interarytenoid muscle and then the thyroarytenoid muscle. And all three of those adduct the vocal cords. Adduct, A-D-duct, means close. Um, so in patients that we say have adductor spasmodic dysphonia, we're saying that these muscles are not behaving appropriately. These muscles are having spasms, and those spasms cause the vocal cords to close inappropriately. Um, so in the middle of a word, someone's saying rainbow, and it comes out right because these closing muscles um, suddenly spasm. And it can be different muscles, which is also a challenge with adductor spasmodic dysphonia that some will have, some of these muscles can be more active than others. Now there's another spasmodic dysphonia subtype called abductor spasmodic dysphonia. So this is controlled by uh, typically just one muscle. Um, the abductor breaks are caused by just one muscle that's called the uh, posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. Here you can see that posterior cricoarytenoid muscle when it fires, it actually causes these vocal cords to fly open. So in this case, patients are talking and um, they might say patty and it comes up patty because um, those vocal cords fly open in the middle of their speech, and that leaves them with very breathy breaks. And of course, if you look at what this muscle is doing, this muscle is actually opening the airway. So that makes it a real challenge to treat because as we, if we were to do either, you know, a denervation procedure or uh, inject Botox, which is a chemical form of denervation, um, we're technically weakening this muscle that opens the airway. And in fact, what we'll see when we treat patients with abductor spasmodic dysphonia with Botox, we'll see that these vocal cords won't be able to open as much after the Botox. And we can get to a point that they really can't breathe well at all because we put so much Botox in that they, um, their vocal cords really can't open well and they really struggle with their breathing. And so this tends to be our most difficult form of spasmodic dysphonia to treat simply because it is the muscle, the only muscle that opens up our um, laryngeal airway. And so it really restricts how much Botox we can put in safely and, um, and what kind of result they're going to get from, from a, a voice standpoint. But we'll have more information on that upcoming. Um, but that's a little bit of uh, the underlying anatomy. Um, so when this all works well, this is what it looks like. Um, this is a normal patient, and you can see when they bring their vocal cords together, what we're seeing here are these adductor muscles, these muscles that close the vocal cords. Those are all working in harmony. So we have the interarytenoid muscle back here, our underlying thyroarytenoid muscle, lateral cricoarytenoid muscle. Um, these muscles are all working in harmony to hold the vocal cords together. And then the patient is just allowing air to flow through this vibratory portion of the cord. So there's no muscles actually right in this vibratory surface. 
Um, and by holding these muscles still, that's what allows us to get that nice, smooth, steady voice. So you'll see as he's holding his voice, holding the speed. Uh, we get that nice, smooth, clear, steady voice. And this is strobe, which allows us to see that vibration of the vocal cords. But it's his ability to hold those muscles steady that allows him to get that nice, steady, smooth sound. And then here you can see as he takes a breath in, that's where that posterior cricorytenoid muscle is activated. And uh, he's able to open up the vocal cords and open up a nice normal airway so he can take a big breath. Now, what happens in adductor spasmodic dysphonia is quite different. So this is a patient who has adductor form of spasmodic dysphonia. And we are looking a little more from a distance, so we're not seeing that super close-up view. But what you'll hear... So you can hear as she tries to hold her vocal cords close together, these muscles are um, spasming. And it's that spasm that of those adductor muscles that's interrupting her continuous voicing. And you can hear it also with her um, continuous speaking, that especially during vowels, she's um, having these adductor or these um, closing muscle breaks that are making her voice sound very, very tight, very strained. And, um, and you almost lose visualization of the actual vibratory vocal folds as she's speaking because of all these um, adductors being so overactive. Um, so the other interesting thing with spasmodic dysphonia is that, um, you know, for over 100 years, it was thought that this was something functional or psychoneurotic. Um, they thought that this was somehow stress-related, it was related um, to something other than, you know, being an organic cause. So it really wasn't until um, 1960s, 1970s, that this became recognized as um, having an organic cause and being recognized as the neurologic disease that it is. And um, so that, um, Dr. Dito described this in 78. Um, actually, Dr. Aronson described in 68 the muscles involved. So he was starting to recognize it as a neurologic disease you know, back in the 1960s. Um, and he described these two subtypes, the adductor uh, spasmodic dysphonia being the type where the uh, vocal cords are closing too much, essentially, and then the abductor spasmodic dysphonia being the subtype where the vocal cords are flying open in the middle of speech, and that's causing the breathy break. Um, and then Dito described back in the 1980s um, something to treat this. And the thought was that if we're dealing with a situation where the spasms are causing too much closure of the vocal cords, well, maybe we can just cut the nerve. And maybe cutting the nerve would allow uh, these uh, patients to have more of a breathy sound and they would eradicate the spasms. And uh, in fact, you know, in, in that way, it did work. About half the patients um, had eradication of their spasms. However, um, you know, some of them did re -innervate, um, So sometimes the nerve regrows, basically. And, and in those cases, they did begin to have spasms again. And in the patients who didn't have spasms, you know, it was somewhat of a trade-off. So they're cutting the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and in doing so, you're actually inducing a vocal cord paralysis. So remember in the original videos we showed, or the original video I showed today, um, we could see that those vocal cords were opening and closing appropriately. Um, after we cut the nerve, this is what happens. Um, so this is a case of a patient where this, this side is not moving. You can see the right side moving open here and then closing here the way it should. And this left side has had a nerve injury. So the nerve has been cut on this left side. And you can hear so you 
can hear and you can see that uh, this patient essentially now is left to work with a leaky valve. Um, the voice is almost a whisper. And so the patient doesn't have spasms anymore, but the patient um, doesn't have a good voice either. So it's not a great trade-off. Um, and in some of these cases, we can go back in, we can actually inject filler substance, or we can put a uh, medialization uh, implant into the paralyzed side, which does close the gap and makes the voice stronger. But um, what we've found over time is as the um, nerve re -innervates, um, a lot of times the spasms come back again. And as we close the gap, a lot of times we hear the spasms um, coming back. So um, this has become less than an ideal treatment over time. Um, one of the um, probably breakthroughs in the history of spasmodic dysphonia is um, the botulinum toxin uh, being discovered as a therapeutic agent. So um, this was originally um, described by Dr. Blitzer and Brin, and um, they were using it for other forms of uh, dystonia and began um, trying it for the larynx. And of course, you can imagine at the time um, that this was quite a stressful uh, event because uh, here they're putting, you know, what was thought to be a, a poison for many years and really just recently in the 1980s here was being used therapeutically. And now they're putting it into these muscles of the voice box, um, you know, very uh, close to the airway and actually the muscles that are the gateway to the airway. So of course they were, they were quite concerned about what would happen and um, they were uh, both involved in uh, speaking at our neurology uh, national study section a couple years ago and described this whole scene and it was very interesting. They talked about uh, the patient coming in and they did the injections into the vocal cords and then they actually kept the patient in the ICU for monitoring, um, being very concerned that you know, something really bad could potentially happen. And of course, nothing happened, which was great. And a couple days later, the patient's voice got, got breathy and um, the spasms resolved and the patient's voice got much better for several months and then it wore off and they uh, were onto something that was gonna work very well for spasmodic dysphonia. <clears throat> and this is actually a slide from Dr. Bren from that talk. And uh, he was describing some of the uh, mechanisms of uh, action of Botox. So um, one of the uh, main mechanisms that we all know about is that uh, the Botox prevents release of acetylcholine. So in that way, it actually um, is creating a, a temporary chemical uh, partial paralysis of the muscles. So, um, you know, it basically blocks release of acetylcholine, which is how nerves tell muscles to fire. Um, so by partially blocking some of that release of acetylcholine, um, we are chemically weakening the muscles. And um, it lasts for typically about, you know, anywhere from three to six months. Um, basically what happens is the patient's body starts making new acetylcholine vesicles and the Botox is long gone, so now the nerve acts completely normally once their body has kind of overridden that initial Botox dose. And so when the Botox wears off, ultimately the patient goes right back to where they were before, um, and it doesn't change the overall course of the disease at all. Um, there is also a newer concept, which is that Botox does have some pain relieving impact, um, we don't know at this point how much of an impact that has on our spasmodic dysphonia patients, but it is something that uh, is also kind of an interesting um, aspect of Botox. So the other thing with um, <clears throat> Botox is that although it's, it, at this point it really is the best thing we have, it really is the standard of care. Um, there are some problems with it. It is not the ideal treatment um, as far as it doesn't, it's not that it is not, it's as good as we have, but there are side effects with it. There are problems with it. It doesn't work for everyone. Um, one of the issues with Botox is that um, we often have patients who fall into this category of kind of a gray zone in diagnosis. Um, so there are patients who have muscle tension dysphonia, and that can look very, very similar to spasmodic dysphonia. Um, muscle tension dysphonia is a situation where the muscles of the voice box are very tight, very similar to adductor spasmodic dysphonia, um, although they tend to do very, very well with voice therapy. 
um, because there is tends to be a, a situation where maybe the patient picked up some bad habits along the way, uh, maybe some kind of real stressful event set something off and, and those muscles went into spasm. Uh, but it's not a neurologic disease the way spasmodic dysphonia is. It's not the basal ganglia sending signals to the voice box. It's, it, is, um, it is more of a muscular disease. And so muscle tension dysphonia does respond very, very well to voice therapy, whereas spasmodic dysphonia doesn't because spasmodic dysphonia is a neurologic disease. Um, so one of the problems with um, Botox is sometimes we're using it inappropriately if we are using it in patients who end up having muscle tension dysphonia. And of course, those patients won't, won't get better. Although if they have pure adductor spasmodic dysphonia, then they tend to do extremely well. Um, the other challenge, though, even with pure adductor spasmodic dysphonia is you can have more than one muscle involved. And I think this, you know, in, in patients where they strictly have their, those thyroretinoid muscles that we were looking at, I mean, if those are the only muscles involved and um, they don't have much tremor, those patients tend to do beautifully with, um, you know, EMG guided Botox injections. But some of our patients will have multiple laryngeal muscles involved. Um, you know, Dr. Hillel has done some beautiful studies on this, looking at uh, which muscles are involved with different uh, types of spasmodic dysphonia. And, we, and he really demonstrated that uh, many patients have mixed forms of spasmodic dysphonia where multiple muscles are involved. Um, and you can have both uh, the closing muscles and sometimes a little bit of the opening muscle being involved. So it can, it can become extremely uh, complicated. And so there are some limitations with Botox. And, um, and sometimes uh, doing a hooked wire EMG can actually be kind of helpful in figuring out which muscles are most active. And then we can really target those muscles a little better with our Botox. Um, so this is a typical setup with um, EMG guided Botox. You can see um, we, this is just beneath the laryngeal cartilage. So we saw that laryngeal cartilage that was housing the vocal cords. Just beneath this is a space called the cricothyroid membrane. And we're gonna put our needle through this little cricothyroid membrane and it goes right into those muscles of the vocal cords. So we can target the thyroarytenoid muscles, which are gonna be more in the center, or those lateral cricoarytenoid muscles, which will be a little more over to the side, both within that thyroid or laryngeal cartilage. Um, and what we're looking for when we do these injections, we're looking for the firing pattern. So we have the you know, patient either say E, or sometimes when, when we um, get in there, we actually get this burst of insertional activity so we know right away we're in the right spot. And then we just put our little bit of Botox in there. And um, it, typically they don't notice a real big difference right away, but several days later, um, anywhere from two to five days later, the Botox effects kick in, the voice becomes really soft, kind of like a whisper sometimes. And ideally, we want that period just to last a few days, um, you know, up to sometimes up to a couple of weeks. But we want that breathy period not to be very long and then to go several months, if possible, with more of a smooth, um, steady voice. And then it wears off and then they come back and we do the whole procedure over again. So in the ideal world, that's what we shoot for with the Botox. Um, this is just an example of the EM, uh, EMG that's handheld. So it just shows that there's some different options when it comes to EMGs, but it does the exact same thing that the, the uh, larger unit that I just showed does. Um, so as I said, you know, adductor spasmodic dysphonia, um, there's three big adductor muscles. And, um, and when we do this EMG guided Botox, where we're going through the front of the neck there, you can see where our needle is actually coming. It just, it runs um, right underneath the, this cartilage. This cartilage is called either thyroid cartilage or laryngeal cartilage. It's the same thing. There's two different names for the exact same thing. So we're running um, between the cricoid cartilage, which is down below, and the um, laryngeal cartilage or thyroid cartilage, which is up above. And we're uh, inserting our needle uh, through there. And then you can um, see that typically our needle is going to end up right about in this area where we can um, be in the thyroid muscle. Um, this isn't the best rep representation of the lateral cricoid. It's actually a little broader than this. 
Um, so we can angle our needle and get over to the lateral cricoarytenoid, but it is more challenging. Um, so if someone has a lot of lateral cricoarytenoid muscle involvement, or if they have a lot of interarytenoid muscle involvement, um, sometimes we can be fairly limited with our EMG-guided Botox. Uh, one of the alternatives we have for those patients who go through that real breathy period and then the effects of the Botox wear off and they don't get a real good stretch of clear voicing, um, there was a procedure that Dr. Blake Simpson described where um, basically he injects a wheel of Botox into this complex uh, or into this um, uh, area superficially above that lateral cricoarytenoid muscle and above the thyroarytenoid muscle. And that seems to um, have been really helpful. Uh, for a lot of, I use this for a lot of my patients who are not getting ideal effects with the EMG guided Botox. We'll, we'll use this approach, especially for those with tremor. I think this can be really helpful because one of the challenges with, with tremor is it often involves multiple muscles. And so, the more muscles we can reach in the larynx, sometimes that can be much more helpful for these patients. Um, so, this is an example of our setup. Of uh, topical lidocaine, so we apply this topically to the larynx. Um, we have a scope that has a little channel on it, a flexible scope for people to the nose, and then this little working channel we can administer lidocaine through it, um, and we can also put our injector needle through it. So everything goes through the nose, so the patient doesn't have to have anything going through their mouth. Or, um, and this is just an example of the needle that we can put through that scope. This example of the actual procedure. Um, this is uh, the scope that they're already through the nose. So here we're already through the nose, and here's our little needle coming through that working channel of the scope. And here you see, as this goes down to the larynx, here's the patient's larynx. This is the patient that actually had a nerve avulsion. You can see his left vocal cord is paralyzed um, as of having that procedure years ago. Uh, but he already is having spasms again. So we are injecting a little bit of Botox into both sides. And we're trying to keep it very superficial there. We go back into the right side here. This is, of course, so we usually inject a little bit more into the side that's moving. And then we're done. You can see that we've gotten these superficial injections on, on both sides. And, um, and that patient has done really, really well with us. He was having more uh, ups and downs with the EMG guided Botox. So doing it this way has been very, very beneficial. Uh, one of the other things we have um, as a challenge is uh, treating our patients with abductor spasmodic dysphonia. And I alluded to this before, but one of the problems with abductor spasmodic dysphonia is the fact that this is also the muscle that opens our laryngeal airway. So if we uh, inject too much, patients do have difficulty breathing. They'll actually um, you know, have noisy breathing. They'll have stridor. They sit on the couch for a week and not be able to get up and do anything because they to breathe uh, and uh, you know and so sometimes we have to go to that extreme to get them to the point that um, so it's not a great trade-off sometimes um, the other challenge with it is where it's located if you look at this if this is the patient in front of the patient's head and this is the back of the patient's head this is where that posterior cricoarytenoid muscle is um, located. So when we go through the cricothyroid membrane here, so when our needle goes through, we have to bore a hole in the cartilage to get to this posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. So if we we're doing it um, from this view, we would be going through this little cricothyroid membrane here, going all the way through the airway, actually boring a hole with our needle into this cartilage to get back to that muscle. So it's, it's a very challenging muscle to um, the alternative is coming in from the side, so sometimes we'll turn the patient's head really far so we can come in from the side to try to reach that muscle. But the challenge with that is there's a lot of swallowing muscles around here, so when we come in from the 
side, sometimes we'll have some difficulty swallowing because these swallowing muscles overlap those posterior cricoarytenoid fibers. And so um, uh, a very interesting um, type of spasmodic dysphonia to treat. Um, so there are some surgical options. Um, I don't think surgery is really the ideal option, um, at least not surgery at the end point, you know, because we're talking about the neurologic here where, you know, it, basically we have um, neurologic input from the basal ganglia going down to these muscles of the voice box. And so just treating the voice box, I don't know if that's the right the, approach. Um, and what tends to happen is people do well for a while. Sometimes they do well for a year or two. But in my experience, uh, when we've done these different surgeries, I find that after a couple of years of that, these adjusts and patients start to have the same problems again. A lot of times we're back to um, considering what we're talking about. Um, but there are some options out there that we should at least discuss. Um, the uh, framework surgery is, is one option that, that has had and patients. Um, this is a procedure that's been described for a very long time, but just really over the last um, 10 years, we've been, we've been more interest for it for uh, adductor and spasmodic pneumonia. Um, but you'll see um, this lateralization thyroplasty. What we're doing here is we're actually creating a cut right down the middle of the uh, laryngeal cartilage, and then we're going to um, pull these uh, two sides apart and use titanium to deflate the uh, laryngeal cartilage so that on the inside, creating more space between those vocal cords. And so we're literally pulling those vocal cords apart so we don't we end up with some like, the breathy hoarseness and you can't hear the spasms and the spasms aren't, aren't nearly as tight. And I'll, I'll run through that in a, a little bit just to give the long-term results with that. Um, the other thing that uh, can be considered is needleization of neuroplasty. And this is something I have done a little more of simply because we use it for abductor spasmodic dysphonia. And I feel like in abductor spasmodic dysphonia, um, treatment options that, that help. And so by putting in implants into these patients, it's quite a bit stronger, and it may not stop the breathy breaks, but if we use this first, if we put implants in, we bring those vocal cords both together, and then maybe in a year or two, if they start to have breathy breaks again, then we still have Botox as an option. So I use it more in conjunction, you know, with or at least with the plan that ultimately we may still need some Botox down the road, but it should make the overall stronger and it seems to work pretty well in that regard. Um, so lateralization thyroplasty um, has been uh, described by different authors, and I will say different authors have had very uh, different results. Um, um, Long-term results are by far the best out there, and um, they've seen, you know, they, they reported 15 patients um, for at least two years follow-up and found patients were all very satisfied with their voice, and there was significant improvement in the different um, unfortunately, it's not been something that others have been able to reproduce real consistently, but I do think it's it certainly warrants continued investigation um, because their their results have been, been quite good. Um, the um, you know, as I mentioned, medial thyroplasty is something to consider for abductor spasmodic dysphonia. And again, this isn't really treating the um, cause of the disease, it's really treating the end organ. Um, but, but it does um, push these vocal cords closer together. So in the case of apart, it helps prevent them from, you know, A, from flying apart quite as much. Um, and, um, and it just helps make, you know, bring the cords together so their voice is a little strong. This is an example of a patient with abductor spasmodic dysphonia. And you can hear those breathy breaks. Okay. 
You can appreciate it has a very different sound than the adductor type, which sounds so tight. This tends to sound breathy. And even with sustained E, often these patients will have some difficulty keeping their vocal cords together, which was one of her uh, points of frustration. She just could not get loud, couldn't project her voice, um, had the breathy breaks, um, and uh, worked on the phone. And so the combination was, was very challenging, and she really did not want to have uh, Botox treatment. So in her case, we did do uh, implants, uh, bilateral medialization laryngoplasty. This is her after the surgery. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Peter Paul. Peter paid Paul. Good. He hit Hal. He hit Hal. So she was uh, very pleased with the improvement, and the improvement lasted um, almost two years. But I will say she's already been back now a couple years out, and starting to have more of the breathy breaks. And, and I do think that's a problem when you're treating the end organ for what really is a, a central neurologic disease. Um, you know, the body tends to adjust and the disease tends to adjust and then we start to have um, problems again. So um, there is uh, one other procedure that I, I think is definitely worth mentioning. Um, this is called the denervation reinnervation uh, procedure that Dr. Um, Jerry Burke out at UCLA described. And uh, one of the problems with the nerve avulsion procedure is the um, reinnervation that occurs after that procedure and the spasms, you know, come back with that uh, reinnervation. Um, the other problem is that you're completely paralyzing the vocal cords. So he um, kind of went around both of these issues by uh, cutting only the adductor nerve, so only the nerve that's going to those muscles that close uh, the vocal cord, and then rewiring that with, uh, with another uh, branch of nerve, the uh, ansa cervicalis. Um, so by doing this, um, we avoid the complete paralysis situation, and it helps um, basically uh, maintain some tone in that vocal cord, uh, but we, we tend to have less of the recurring spasms. Um, the challenge with this, um, is it's, you know, it can be a very uh, difficult procedure um, to do. Uh, and I think most um, physicians who uh, have tried this procedure, we haven't gotten the same results that Dr. Burke has, has gotten. I think he's gotten very impressive results and um, some fellows that have trained with him have gotten very impressive results. Um, but, um, you know, most uh, physicians don't get quite the success that, that he has had. And I know in my own hands, I've had patients who ultimately have come back and needed more Botox after this type of procedure. Um, so, um, so it's, you know, it's out there. Um, but I think if, if one were to have a procedure like this, I would definitely go to a physician who does a lot of them. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know, one of the things that I think the future of spasmodic dysphonia is going to hold is um, is getting to the um, the root cause of the problem. And you know, there's certainly many studies now where they're looking at DBS or deep brain uh, stimulation for various forms of dystonia. And um, Dr. Uh, Honey is uh, um, a doctor who's investigating it for spasmodic dysphonia, and the NSDA is is supporting that. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what the future brings uh, regarding that, because I think that's probably one of the procedures that has, is the most promising in the way of really getting uh, down to the root cause of spasmodic dysphonia. So um, in conclusion, spasmodic dysphonia is a voice-specific laryngeal movement disorder. It's specific to the patient talking and voicing, uh, which can make it very difficult to diagnose. It makes it difficult for people to understand sometimes. There can be variable presentations um, in the muscles involved, and, and in uh, each individual is very, very different. So it, that makes it challenging uh, as we're treating patients with Botox um, because there just is not... 
um, a single, you know, one fits all kind of uh, plan. Every plan has to be very individualized to the patient. Um, and certainly some uh, new treatment options uh, for spasmodic dysphonia are warranted. So I look forward to the next, you know, 10, 20 years to see what new studies will bring and, and do have high hopes for DBS and, and studies like that that might be looking at the underlying cause of the disease, um, because I think in, in that way our future can be very bright.